So a couple short stories to open us up today. It's the first half of a basketball game. The center for the first time steps out, shoots a three pointer and makes it. They get really excited and they shoot another one and make it. They spend halftime bragging about how they made two three pointers the first of their life. They shoot four more in the second half and miss them all. Their team is outscored and out rebounded because the center is out shooting three pointers. The team loses defeated by his first half success. <laughs> a painter has gotten really good at edging. So good, he's discovered it. he can paint faster than any other painter in town. He doesn't have to do the prep work. He doesn't have to tape anything off. He can take more jobs than anyone else and starts lining them up until he's painting when an earthquake hits and he leaves a streak across a ceiling a bucket of paint down the side of a wall and he loses his next three jobs because he can't get to them. He is defeated by his success. Defeated by success. Some of you will recognize that also as a quote out of the third Batman movie in the trilogy, the, the Nolan films. Bane, the bad guy, tells Batman he has become defeated by his success. He's become a hero and become lovable. He's forgotten the darkness that made him who he was, defeated by success. Scripture tells the story of a boy named David who turns out to be a great shepherd. He's so good with a slingshot, he can defeat wild animals even as a young boy. He practices music while he's out in the fields with the herd and gets so good with the harp he can soothe the mental angst of a moody king in King Saul. Along the way, David decides that God is the source of his blessing and has protected him. David's probably not wrong about that in some ways, but he decides he must be invincible. He believes it even more after he and his slingshot defeat the, Goli the giant Goliath. And once David is king, he seems to think he is invincible and not needing really this thing called self-reflection. David takes a soldier's wife as his own and never questions himself. He has the soldier move to the front line to eliminate the complication and still no self-reflection. When a prophet comes and confronts David, suddenly he realizes he has been defeated by his own success. He bought into the narrative of who he was. It's a struggle because God from the beginning tells the people, you don't want a king. Kings only take advantage of you. And they said, but look at all the nations around us. They have kings. We want a king. And they keep telling Samuel, their prophet at the time, we want a king like the others. And God says, tell the people what kings will do, how the king will take their sons and put them in front of chariots take their daughters and make them serve, how the kings will lead them into war. The people beg still for a king, and so God begrudgingly gives them Saul. Saul looks the part, but falls apart. David picks up the pieces after Saul and expands the kingdom. Israel grows so much. Just historically, think about the story as we've been telling it. We had the creation story and the flood, but then we get this covenant with Abraham and the promise that Abraham will have many descendants. And we follow one line of those descendants through Isaac. We get 12 brothers and 12 tribes. But then those 12 tribes come out of slavery in Egypt and forge themselves into one people and now into one nation state, one kingdom. They have risen up and become something more than they ever imagined. And as they have, there have been prophets that God has also risen up to try to keep them in check, that they might not be defeated by their own success. Prophets rise up and warn them to be faithful to God, not feel entitled by God, warning them to be good to one another, not take for granted the role that every person plays. The priests beg kings to be faithful to the leadership and as leaders. Prophets beg the kings and the people to stay faithful to God. But in the end, 
In the end, the kingdom ends up divided. They make it through Saul, David, David's son, Solomon, and that's as long as they make it as one kingdom, about 120 to 150 years. It's 40 years per king, but as our Thursday night group has talked, 40 sometimes just means a really long time in the Bible. It rained for 40 days and nights. Okay, that means a long time. 40 years in the wilderness. Okay, symbolically a long time. Jesus even, 40 in the wilderness, 40 nights. Okay, it's a long time. It's not magically all the same number. It's symbolic of a long period of time. So we get three long reigns from three kings that mostly got it. But the people fell apart. They were defeated by their success. Eventually, the northern kingdom, which is Samaria as a capital and known as Israel, and there's some little maps in the back with the activity sheet for today if you all want these to look along or to look at after worship. The northern kingdom with Samaria as the capital separates from Judah with Jerusalem as the capital. That good Samaritan story that comes up later from Jesus starts to kick in a little here, right? So these are the same nation. The Assyrians come in and conquer the north. But as they look south, they see the city of Jerusalem and all its walls and say, no, thank you, we'll stop here. But all those folks in the northern kingdom, all these people of God, really 10 of the 12 tribes, if you look at where they settled, many get taken into exile, a diaspora that led the Jewish community to talk about them as the 10 lost tribes in their genealogy and history. Eventually, Babylon comes along and defeats the Syrians and comes down and says, Jerusalem, no problem, we'll take them too. And they take 25% of the wealthiest, educated, and storyteller leaders, the priests, out and into exile in Babylon. They destroy the temple, and the south falls. They were warned. Prophets threatened exactly what did happen would unfold. It was predictable. Some historians have said it wasn't as much prophecy as it was watching advancing armies and warning the king. But even then, in the face of facts and reality, leaders didn't want to face what was right in front of them. I know we've moved past that in the world today, where leaders now make all their decisions based on facts and data and not emotions and what people think in their own bravado. I'll give you a moment. They were warned, but they thought they were invincible. They thought God's protection lasted no matter what they did. They assumed it only led to success, and they were defeated by their own success. There's a little irony in here to all of the Sams, the Davids, the Jeremiahs, the Isaiahs, the Zeeks, the Joels, the Jonathans of the world. This is the section of scripture as we enter into this next section of this nation state. This is where your names come from. That they may be some of the least read and least studied pieces of scripture. We go back to the Genesis stories because they're narratives and they're easy to tell. You can put pictures of animals on children's nursery walls and tell the story. We can relate to them. We don't get strange names and kingdoms where we have to keep up with the geopolitical reality to understand what's going on. And it's not like Jesus where we can just follow the narrative and also see where our life fits in salvation-wise. No, no, this period of Israel's history has so much to teach us but gets so little emphasis. So today we want to step back and realize we are making a transition from the narrative story of a family becoming tribes and a nomadic people to a nation state for a large chunk of the story. A large chunk of scripture is the dialogue in this time. You have first and second Samuel, Kings and Chronicles, walking us through this section of history, this story of God's people. And then you have all these prophets speaking to those events through the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. And then you have the people's experience at home in the midst of the hurt and the pain and those in exile, looking back on it, they write poetry, they write laments, lamentations, they write songs about it, psalms. And although they get attributed to David, the things they write about are in the exile. 
Back then, we didn't do the whole plagiarism the same way. If you gave somebody else's name to it, it was an honor. It was inspired by them. It wasn't considered to be theirs. We, we treat that academically a little different today in attribution. I wish I could just tell you this was a sermon by a famous minister and everybody would listen to it different. We treat it differently, but all those hurts, the laments, the Proverbs, the wisdom, they're a product of this period in Israel. The experience of exile, of coming and going, of seeing what was counted on for generations decimated and sitting in rubble. When the stones that marked time and told the stories are torn down, it inspires these stories and whole new understandings of God. And this is a period of Israel's history worth spending time in. Because if no other reason, we're already repeating the mistakes. Many, many years later, after Israel as a nation had fallen, many years later, a small group of Christians went searching for a new world. They hopped on boats from England, where the Church of England said you had to believe one way, think one way, pray one way, believe and behave one way. They went seeking religious freedom, believing that God had set them apart, believing God would protect and guide them. These early pilgrims found their promised land, and much like the promised land that we heard about in Joshua last week, there were other people living there. At first, the two managed to coexist, but that's not today's story. Because as much as that becomes a drama in our nation's history, there was already drama amongst the Christians. There was already within the Christian utopian religious freedom community, big trouble. Some believed they knew better than the rest. Some believed the success and them as the leaders were ordained by God. They decided that to stay successful, everybody had to stay the same. Now, it wasn't like a baseball team where they're all wearing the same underwear every game. No, no, no. This becomes more doctrinal, less superstitious. We have to keep the same behaviors. Nothing can change and everybody has to match. We all have to think alike, pray alike, believe alike, behave alike, all in the name of religious freedom. New colonies were formed as those who couldn't behave were banished. And what did they form their colonies on the foundation of? Religious freedom. And then they set their doctrine as they became the ones in power and banished others. Some left in advance going on out and saying, this isn't religious freedom. We need to practice it differently than this. So I'll take my way of being it and go over here. And all of a sudden we have 13 colonies all formed in the name of religious freedom. It seems that if one of them had religious freedom, we wouldn't need the other 12, right? Along the way, more people come from Europe, fleeing religious dogma, imperialism of the different nations, not just from England, from France, from Spain, from Portugal. They find their ways across this new world. Along the way, a group of them band together and we get United States, right? In our nation's history. New colonies formed, joined together, and proclaim their independence, their interdependence in many ways, throwing off the yoke of imperialism. They come together and declare independence, declare themselves a group of United States, and many were thankful that God had been with them in all the ups and downs, that God had helped them persevere, that they weren't alone in this, and their faith helped carry them through. Others in the same period, looked at God's role a little differently. They thought God had ordained them as the leaders. They felt all the success was guided by God, that the lives lost were the will of God. The lives of opponents on the battlefield, the lives of indigenous people caught in the crossfire, those as they spread out. They gave God credit for all because their success was ordained by God, their leadership ordained by God, and they believed everyone needed to think like them, pray like them, you get the drill, right? Till freedom that they fought for became contingent on their piety. We fought for freedom as long as we all behave the same. Till the separation of church and state they designed was bypassed. Women and children were treated as lesser people. 
in the name of scripture. Slaves from Africa were treated as less than human, justified by scripture, and different was determined to be a threat to the public good. That that was different was considered a threat, and here's the irony, diversity is the foundation of creation. We get seven days of creation in Genesis 1 and all the spectrums of it. We get the Genesis 2 creation story. Two stories to tell creation, four gospels to tell a story of one Jesus. Diversity has been a part of what we do from the beginning. Pentecost is a story of people from all over the world understanding one another. Diversity has been in there from the very beginning. Jesus crossed ethnic lines. He reached out to the Samaritans, the family from the north that the south had distanced themselves from and calls them the heroes of the story. He draws in women and children and says the kingdom of God's like these. Check yourselves. But in the name of that Jesus, we decided difference was a threat to the kingdom of God as if anything humans create could be a threat to God. How did we decide we had that much power, but we don't have the power to overcome our divisions? How can we decide that our diversity is a threat to God to the point that we become a threat to one another? And we've doubled down on it throughout our history. After the Civil War, there was a movement towards sameness. Communities started creating Jim Crow laws to keep the divides we had just theoretically eliminated in a war. And it laid the foundation for the mass incarceration of black men, gave excuses to arrest people for little to no reason at all, and leaves us in a mess we're still trying to sort out today. After the Civil War, churches played their part by shifting the theology from a communal salvation. If you read sermons before the Civil War, our salvation was not individual. It was not personal hell insurance that you could check and see which church had the least resistance to achieve. You couldn't do, see if Geico or farmers had better hell insurance for you. You didn't, you didn't get to see if the Baptists or the Presbyterians had at least oppressive way of being to get yourself to the promised land. No, no, it was communal. We were all in it together. Revelation was something we were going to bring about by the peace that we brought about as the kingdom of God, as God's children, beating our swords into plowshares and inviting the Prince of Peace back. After the Civil War, it changed. Preachers in the South, and then it moved to the North very quickly and spread beyond, started preaching about individual piety. They started talking about, well, there's nothing we can do. It's all in the hands of God. We'll just have to live in this sinful mess till God comes back and judges us all. And if I've confessed and I'm okay, then all is good in the world. I don't have to worry about change anymore. We literally use the church to give permission to not change and justify Jim Crow and not have to do a thing about it. After World War II, there was a similar movement towards sameness. Black soldiers returning were not given the same rights for education, for housing that white soldiers were. And we wonder why there's a housing and income gap today. In 1946, in this post-war sameness, for the first time, the scriptures used the word homosexual. 1946 is the first English translation of scripture that way. Until then, it was more ambiguous. We didn't know what it means. Why didn't they do it sooner? Because they were reading the Greek and the Hebrew. It's not in there. That word's not in there. We added it post-World War II in a sense of sameness. Soldiers came back after fighting fascism to a society obsessed with sameness and oppression. And the church remained silent in the midst of it. We had convinced each other that each other were such a threat, we had to homogenize everything. We were defeated by our success. And now today, things are much different. Our nation has grown, our economy has grown, our society has grown. As has the gap between the richest and the poorest. As has the gap in education and healthcare. As has the hate spewed in the name of Jesus. We have grown so much. Our diversity has new expressions. We can put a rainbow flag in front of our church and people know there is a safe sanctuary and we can live into this. But we also know that there's so much more still to be done. We cannot be defeated by our success.
There are preachers on TV, on the radio, and in pulpits. And for the last 20 years, their prosperity gospel has been telling people that if you believe the right things and behave the right way, good things will happen to you, despite every bit of evidence in Scripture. Money will appear in your life, and you will have an attractive heteronormative partner with good hair if you only follow the gospel the way we prescribe it, especially the good hair. If you believe the right things, if you behave the right way, good things will happen. You will be healthy. You will be respected and loved. Despite what the statistics on childhood cancer tell us, they've preached away on it. None of this nonsense is scriptural, but it's described as both faithful, get this, and American. Faithful and American. There's a word for it in our popular lexicon. It's called Christian nationalism. And if we want to be clear about it, if you want to look at where the message comes from, it's not just Christian nationalism. What's the adjective that goes before it? It's white Christian nationalism. Because I guarantee you, there's not a black preacher today standing in a pulpit telling their people that bad stuff's not going to happen if God's with them. There is not a Hispanic pastor, a Latino pastor standing in a pulpit. There's not a Latina somewhere proclaiming that nothing bad is going to happen to you if you have brown skin, if you just believe the right things. They've been there. They've lived it. They were not defeated by their success. There's other preachers, too. The church has stayed silent in the face of their stuff as well. If you believe and behave the right ways, if you behave the right ways, if you put the silver ring on your finger, you won't have hormones. If you don't hold hands with someone of the opposite sex, you will find attraction to them eventually. If you just let Jesus into your heart, relationships will all work out in the end. And every divorced couple ever says, what? Every abused partner says, what? Everyone who has prayed for their partner to stop beating them because the priest, the pastor, father such and such said so, and it's never mother such and such. It's always father such and such. The number of tombstones that reflect that story shows we have been defeated by our success. All of this, all of this sense that there is a first class ticket to heaven for those who believe and behave the right ways goes against everything Jesus preached. But both are described as faithful and what? American. And as the American church grew, buildings were erected, family centers were constructed, coffee shops and bowling alleys found their additions onto the building. All of this proof that God had blessed our work, even in mainline congregations. Let's not pretend we're exempt from this. Proof that God loved us the most. There's a great line in the movie Head of State where Chris Rock is thrown into the race for president as a young black alderman from Chicago thrown into the sacrificial limb that they don't want to win. His opponent, the white Republican from the South, his catch line, his slogan is, God bless America and no one else. It's funny until we start to hear it in the ways we've teached as church or in our silence when other people have proclaimed such. Over the last 20, 30 years, 40 years, we have seen the growth of the American church and now it's declined. We have seen the growth of the church, and we assumed it was the will of God. It was a cultural and economic manifest destiny. It was our right to cover the earth and put a church on every corner. And if somebody already had one there and they weren't believing and behaving the right way, God wanted me to put up another one. That was our attitude. The gospel of Jesus defeated by the church's success. So where do we go from here? 
Christian nationalist symbols were all over the Capitol building on January 6th. People are denying elections and the rights of others in the name of God. And small congregations across America are closing their doors each day. Of course, they are closing. They bought a lie. Or we listened to the lie in silence. We listened to the lie in silence. Of course, churches are closing. We made our neighbor into a threat. How can we be a neighborhood church? Or we allowed the church next door to us to get away with it and never said anything. We called it unity. Of course, of course, churches are closing. We spent generations telling people how bad they were. We spent generations telling people their kind weren't welcome in the church. Of course, they stopped coming to church. We told them to stop coming. We pretended everyone was like us, only to discover America is a diverse nation. Who knew? People came from all over the globe, all across Europe, all spoke all these different languages at the beginning. Who knew we were diverse? We colonized people from all over the world, spread our Christianity, and invited them to the Jesus capital of all sameness right here. Then we're surprised that they showed up. We forced people to come to this land from all over an entire continent that we pretend is a small neighborhood called Africa, assuming they all have all the same roots in common. That's a diverse community too. Asia and Africa are not small countries the size of Rhode Island. There's diversity within all of our diversity and we seem surprised by it. While trying to make white Christian nationalist ideals the norm by which we could all feel comfortable in our future salvation. Of course, people stopped coming, we told them to. The church demanded that everyone be the same to fit in, but God's people are diverse. God's people don't think the same. We have many gifts, but one spirit. You know how I know that? It's in the Bible. People from all over can come together, and when they hear the gospel, they can all understand it. You know how I know that? It's in the Bible. God created people, and they spread out across the earth. God blessed many nations of people. How do we know it? It's in the Bible. And they all struggled, and they found God in the struggle. And they all loved, and they found God in the love. For too long, we have been defeated by our success. No more. No more. It's time for the church to speak truth to the world. People are not homeless. They're our neighbors. When you house them, they're no longer homeless. You can stop being scared of them. You don't have to be scared of the addicts. They're our family. Love them. Care for them. When they're no longer other, you don't have to be scared of them. They're your brother, your sister, your neighbor. People are not convicts. They're hurting. Heal them. Then you don't have to be scared of them. And maybe they'll heal you too. People are not heartless. Let's be honest, they're also not homophobes, sexists, or racists. They are people driven by fear and shame. They're people who've been fed a lie in the name of God, and we set silent for it. They're hurting. Forgive them. It's time for the church to speak truth to the world, confessing that we were defeated by our success. We were defeated by our success. But Christ invites us to rise again. Christ invites us to rise again, even when we have tripped over ourselves, even when we have hurt others, even when we have caused the division and the pain that we desperately seek to overcome, when we have caused the gap in a relationship, when we have caused the pain in a partnership, we are invited to rise again. When we have caused our self-harm, when we have put ourselves as last, cast ourselves off, given up on our own person, tried to wound our own body, God invites us to rise again. Christ invites us to rise rise again and rise again. Because church, God is not done. 
We don't have to be afraid. Christ invites us, rise again. Because God's not done with us yet. Amen. Amen. Thank you.